And let me invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians 11. promise we will get into Colossians here in just a few minutes. But I want to begin with 2 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 3 this morning. It'll it'll, uh, spring us into Colossians. Second Corinthians eleven three. Follow along with me. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And in this passage, as Paul says, bear with him or put up with, uh, he's not making a mere observation. This is sort of a combination of a warning and a rebuke. And as Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, he's doing what he often does. He's encouraging this church to stay on track with what they have believed and what they originally have been taught. And you notice he highlights two separate things um, that are really the same thing. He says, beware of men who come preaching another Jesus or another gospel. It's really the same thing. And even though these warnings are 2,000 years old, there's something extraordinarily modern about this warning. Because if you ever find yourself today talking to people about spirituality, talking to them about religion in general, or who knows, maybe talking to them about Christianity, you know that people might say something like this. For me, Jesus is like... Or, I like to think of Jesus as, for example, um, one man wrote this. I like to think of Jesus as the great possibility thinker. If you want to find happiness, real forever happiness, then learn more about Jesus Christ. I refer to him as the greatest possibility thinker who ever lived. To Jesus, every person was a gold mine of undiscovered, hidden possibilities. Jesus truly believed that common people can become uncommonly powerful. He truly believed that common people can become extraordinary possibility thinkers. So, Jesus made it his aim to give self-confidence to inferiority complex persons. He, He made it his aim for guilt-infected, failure-plagued, problem-swamped persons to start loving themselves and stop hating themselves. So that's one way people like to think of Jesus. It's not exactly rooted in any historical creeds or uh, any sacred text, but I like to think of Jesus as fill-in-the-blank. Another man wrote, I like to think of Jesus as one who became a god, and is able to extend his powers to others. Jesus is the Son of God the Father, and as such, inherited powers of Godhood and divinity from his Father, including immortality, the capacity to live forever. Furthermore, Jesus can extend those same attributes and powers to others. While he walked the dusty roads of Palestine as a man, he possessed the powers of a God and ministered as one having authority. So another angle on how some men like to think of Jesus, and, you know, it seems like everybody has a warm-hearted place for Jesus, but it also tends to be very private and sentimental. Here's, Here's another one. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo T-shirt, because it says, like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party too. I like to party so I like my Jesus to party. The man's friend chimed in and added, I like Christ Jesus in Christmas better, the tiny Jesus with golden fleece diapers. Now, who are all these quotes from? 
Well, by your chuckles, some of you know that last quote is from the movie Talladega Nights. Go ahead. You can embarrassment sink under your chair uh, in a dinner prayer or what you might call a prayer. The first quote, however, I like to think of Jesus as the greatest possibility thinker who ever lived. That's from a uh, pastor, the, the late Reverend Robert Schuler, who back in the late 70s and early, uh, early 80s, he was sort of the sophisticated face of the prosperity gospel, and that came from his book, The Be Happy Attitudes. The second quote, however, I'm going to come back to as to someone who likes to think of Jesus as a God. But this morning, I want to reveal that all of those quotes, all of those sentiments about who we want Jesus to be or who some people like to feel Jesus is, reveals that people like Jesus as long as it's a certain Jesus. And my question this morning is, does the Bible give us permission to do that? The passage we read earlier, church at Corinth would say, no. Because Paul says very clearly there are some who preach another Jesus. Meaning that Paul believes there was one correct historical objective, Jesus. And so the implications of Paul saying that some preach another Jesus, the implications are that it means people can like Jesus, but it not be the true Jesus. People can aim to imitate the example of Jesus, but it not be the true Jesus. People can serve Jesus, and it not be the true Jesus. The implications are that people can even sing to Jesus with their hands extended up to heaven and tears rolling down their cheeks, but it not be the true Jesus. The implications are even that people can study and even on an academic level write scholarly books about Jesus while all along it's not the true Jesus. But in contrast to Paul's warnings about another Jesus, Colossians 1 has Paul explaining the right Jesus. And so turn to Colossians 1 now with me. For the last few weeks, we've been not only in Colossians 1, but specifically verse 15, we've had the words image and firstborn under a microscope. But today I want to move to the next couple of verses and do sort of a general read of them as we compare Paul's description of the right Jesus with the description of Jesus given by a religious group called the Mormons in a similar way that last week we made this comparison with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I just want to make three points this morning as we continue. Number one, the core of Christology in Colossians. Number two, the Christology of Mormonism. And number three, the writings of Mormonism. So let's begin. These are on the back of your bulletin if that helps you. But number one is the core of Christology in Colossians. While much can be said about Paul's Christology in Colossians 1 verses 15 through 23, one thing is certain, there is a core to it all. There's a seedbed by which it all flows out of. There's a, a foundation and that is this, it's the simple message, Jesus Christ is God. That is the seedbed of everything else that Paul is saying about Jesus in Colossians 1. Yes, he emphasizes that Jesus Christ is supreme over all. Yes, he emphasizes that Jesus Christ is eternal. Yes, he emphasizes that Jesus Christ is sovereign, but all of those are if you are emanations from the foundation, the core, Jesus Christ is God. In fact, look at verse 16 with me. All things were created through him and for him. Christ created it all. 
And, and you do not have to have a, a PhD in cultural anthropology to realize that all people groups around the world, humanity universally has this idea within their religious systems that the one who created all things is God. And Paul says, that's Jesus. The Bible claims that to be Jesus. Also, this core of Christology that Jesus, that Jesus Christ is God is found in verse 19. Look, for in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And certainly we get sort of a, 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 a glimmer of the first person of the Trinity there, the God the Father, but we also see clearly that Jesus is fully God. There's nothing missing in Jesus concerning his divinity. And so we cannot miss that when we read Colossians 1. It is quite clear. The core of Paul's Christology is that Jesus Christ is God. And this was the case in all of the early church, by the way, as, as early as those disciples were walking and talking with Jesus. When we think of Thomas, for example, in John 20, verse 28, he said what? My Lord and my God. And notice Jesus didn't correct him. Jesus didn't say, oh, Thomas, it's, it's one thing for you to call me Lord. People can understand that like, like your boss, your master. But to call me God is going a little too far. Watch out, Thomas, if you keep that up, you're going to get me killed. Jesus didn't say that. And so Jesus claimed to be God, and the early church took him to be God. And so number one this morning, the core of, of Christology in Colossians is that Jesus Christ is God. However, let's pause and compare that with the Christ of Mormonism, kind of in our view today as we continue to talk about the attributes of Jesus. So number two this morning, the Christology of Mormonism. Some of us may work with Mormons, some of us may have Mormons in our family, some of us may come from a Mormon background, but as we think of Mormonism in general, as we think of those fine young looking men riding bicycles in their white dress shirts and ties, let's pause and ask what do they actually believe about Jesus. If Colossians 1 had to fill in the blank, Christ is blank, it would undoubtedly say Christ, Jesus Christ is God. But if Mormons were to fill in that blank, they would say Jesus Christ is a God. The second quote I gave earlier was actually from a Mormon theologian. I like to think of Jesus as one who became a God and is able to extend his powers to others. Mormons believe that God the Father and God the Son are two gods among millions. Or technically, the theologians would say it's an infinite amount of gods. There's no way to count. But let's just say millions. But these two are the gods in relation to planet Earth only. Which means when you're talking to that young man on your front porch about Christ truly being God, that young man will nod his head and say, absolutely we believe that Christ is God. But in the back of his mind, he's thinking of this planet. Yes, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is God. He is divine of this planet. But this is in direct contradiction to Colossians 1.16 because Paul clearly tells us that not only by Christ all things were created, but Paul adds to that just in case we have trouble with all things. I mean, all things means all things, doesn't it? Paul clarifies by saying, visible or invisible, meaning there is nothing in existence that is in existence that Christ did not create. Visible and invisible means even if there are planets that we do not know of, and I assure you there are, 
even if there are life in other universes, even if there are things we cannot understand in our own solar system, visible and invisible, Christ created it all. And of course, Mormonism's idea of a, a pantheon of millions of gods also contradicts other parts of Scripture. But what does the Bible say about the idea of many gods? Because believe it or not, that term is in the Bible, but in every case, it's talking about false idols, gods that are not gods, gods especially in the Old Testament, gods who have eyes but cannot see, who have ears but cannot hear, gods that are man's attempt to create a god for him to worship his own way. However, the Bible is very clear that there are no actual gods beyond the one God that we know in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, look on the screen at Isaiah 43.10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Yahweh is saying, there's not, not going to be another God after me, and there's no God before me. I'm the one and only. And so if a Mormon friend tells you that there are many gods, point to Isaiah 43, or point to 1 Timothy 1.17, or Romans 16.27. But let me show you one other verse because it actually handles two issues that are in direct contradiction with the Bible that Mormons believe. John 1.18, look at it on the screen. No one has ever seen God. The only God, the one who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This verse alone actually corrects two heresies that Mormonism hinges on. Number one, it declares there's only one God. And number two, it declares no one has seen him. Of course, you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that God the Father is invisible. Therefore, no one has seen God the Father. But the origin story, if you will, of Mormonism hinges on the fact that there was a man here on earth who saw God the Father, and that man's name was Joseph Smith. So for just a moment, let's, let's think about that origin story. Some of you are maybe familiar with it, others of you maybe have never heard of it, but Joseph Smith was born in Vermont in 1805, and he had both a, a, a Methodist and a Presbyterian upbringing, and in 1820, when Smith was just 15 years old, he began to be kind of disillusioned about all of the churches that were available to go to. And he, uh, according to his testimony, one day he was out in the woods and he was praying to God, God, which is the right church? And, he, you know, he was having a conversation in his mind similarly to some of the dinner conversations that we have in our home uh, as recently as just a few nights ago. Now, Dad, tell me again the difference between Protestants and Catholics. T tell me again, are, are Baptists Protestants? Tell me again where Presbyterians fit in, and, and where, who are we? I, I know it can be confusing, but Smith was having that conversation in his mind, and in an attitude of prayer in the woods, he says, God, which is the right church? Which church should I join? And according to Smith... God the Son and God the Father stood before him and told him all churches are corrupt, but that you, Joseph Smith, are going to be used to restore the true church. In fact, in their book, The Pearl of Great Price, this is paramount to what they believe, for they, Christian churches, were wrong. All their creeds were an abomination. Now, we're going to come back to Joseph Smith, but I want to first make the point that everything that Mormons believe in their doctrine start out with an experience of a 15-year-old young man. 
And so, and it starts out with his experience saying what the Bible says is impossible, that he saw God the Father and talked with God the Father. And so, to understand, however, Mormonism's full Christology, it would not stop by saying that Jesus Christ is a God. It would go on to say Jesus Christ is a God in the same sense that you and I can become gods. At least men in this room. Some Mormon theologians, when it comes to women, say that when upright Mormon men become gods themselves, their wives are their celestial helpmates forever and, and possibly can get many other wives at the same time. Others actually call them goddesses. But whether you call them eternal helpmates or whether you call them goddesses, the question is, goddesses of what? Well, of their own planets. And so like God the Son and God the Father have an authoritative domain over planet Earth, according to Mormonism, you too can have an authoritative domain. You can rule over your own planet because... You are, in essence, the very same as God. Now, folks, as historic Christians, we believe that we will, in one way or the other, rule and reign with Christ in heaven. But did you know that of all four times the Bible mentions us reigning in heaven, did you know that every time it says, with Christ, with Christ? And so this idea that deep down in you is the exact species of who God the Father and God the Son is, you are of the same essence that permeates throughout Mormonism. In fact, they would say the only essential difference between God the Father, God the Son, and you and every other God is that the Father and the Son have already passed their tests of goodness. The question is, are you going to pass your test of goodness? And Joseph Smith was very clear to say, and only the Mormon church have the keys in order for you to pass. Uh, Brigham Young, who was the the second president and prophet of the Mormon church, probably the most influential writer next to Joseph Smith, Brigham Young said this, quote, Man is the king of kings and lord of lords in embryo. Again, that idea that the essence of God is you, it's in you. You just haven't passed your test yet. Young went on to say in in another writing, the Journal of Discourses, quote, the Lord created you and me to become gods like himself. And some Mormon theologians refer to this as the plan of eternal progression. Meaning, when we read of God the Father in Scripture, um, a Mormon would interpret that to mean that God the Father in Scripture... He himself was once man, and he had a father and mother, born just like a natural birth. And his father had a father, and his father had a father, and his father had a father, on into eternity. And so you and me now are part of this eternal progression of deities. Now, according to Mormon theology, this gets a little technical, so bear with me. The reason God the Father after he became a god, chose Jesus as his son over his other son, who was Lucifer. The reason the father chose Jesus is because Lucifer had the plan to require the inhabitants of earth to worship the father. Jesus, however, had the plan that no Father, I want the people of earth to, in their own free will, choose you. And so the Father chose Jesus' plan over Lucifer's, and there's been a cosmic sibling battle going on ever since. But again, the point here to remember is this plan of eternal progression, that we are all potential gods in the exact same way as God the Son and God the Father. One Mormon apostle by the name of Legrand Richards wrote, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. 
Joseph Smith wrote, quote, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heaven. I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see he was once a man like us. And you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves. But folks, again, this is in complete contradiction to what Scripture tells us. Romans 16.26 on the screen mentions that Paul says that we have an eternal God. He has always existed as God. Deuteronomy 33.27, the eternal God is thy refuge. In fact, the verse before 27, 26 says, there's none like him. There's none like him. Contrary to the idea that we are the exact same species of God, no. Throughout the Bible, there is none like him. Now, yes, we are made in his image. Yes, meaning among other things that God created us to have relationships and to love and to be creative and more importantly than all of that, to be able to commune with our creator. Yes, we're made in his image. But we will not ever become gods. Psalm 89, verse 6. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Answer, no one. God is infinitely greater than we are. In fact, that is why it will take eternity to comprehend all of him. It'll take eternity to see all of God in his true majesty. And by the way, folks, there there are even recently teachers in the charismatic movement. I'm thinking of Chris Vallotton from Bethel who says, we are gods. I don't know which is more dangerous for Mormonism to say that we will become gods or to hear we are gods now. And it doesn't help to make the distinction, God is God, capital G, we are God's little g. No, you don't want to say that. That's actually heresy. We're not gods now. We will not become gods. We are now creatures, will always be creatures, someday in the presence of our creator. Let's look now at the writings of Mormonism. We've looked, number one, at the core of Christology and Colossians, meaning Jesus Christ is God. We've looked, number two, at the Christology of Mormonism, but now let's actually ask, where do these doctrines come from? Well, to begin with, Mormons believe in what is called open canonization, meaning that they do have authoritative writings, but they also believe that revelation is open. Their apostles and prophets can add to or take away from their writings that are quote-unquote official. But the four authoritative writings within Mormonism are number one, the Book of Mormon, number two, the Doctrines and Covenants, number three, the Pearl of Great Price, and number four, the Bible in the King James Version. And since it all started with Smith writing the Book of Mormon, it might help to understand how it came to be written. And so let's go back in time a little bit and and visit Joseph Smith again as a a young man. Again, this started when he was 15. And growing up, Joseph Smith earned money as a type of dowser. Uh, But instead of using a witching stick, he had some rocks that he said had magical properties. And so Joseph Smith would be hired on by a rancher or a landowner to be able to look at these rocks and tell the landowner where there might be gold buried on his land or silver buried on his land. This is, I didn't find with any of my sources how successful he was at doing this, but he made money from it. He was a dowser. Well, three years after his supposed experience with God the Father and God the Son, in 1823, Joseph Smith had another visitation, but this time it was with an angel. 
an angel named Maroni. And according to Smith, he's 18 years old at this point, the angel showed him where some golden plates were hidden that had a very ancient Egyptian writing on them. And Joseph supposedly found where those plates were. Fast forward just a few years in 1827, Joseph says that not only did that angel appear to me, but I acquired a special seer stone from the angel. Some Mormon historians say he found this at the bottom of a well. Some say the angel gave it to him. But either way, Smith knew what this special seer stone was for. It was to interpret what was written on the golden plates. And so what Smith did there in 1827 with the help of his friend Oliver Cowdery is Smith would put this special stone in a hat. And when he put his face in the hat, he was able to read on the stone the translation and the interpretation of what was on the golden plates. And so his, his friend Oliver Cowdery was close to him, and so uh, according to his story, Joseph Smith was put his face in the hat, see on the stone words pop up, kind of like a text message, just on the stone, and Smith would say out loud what he was reading, translated into English because it's in ancient Egyptian, his friend Cowdery would write it down. It was his, his scribe. And as soon as Joseph Smith said, yes, that's correct, the sentence would disappear and a new sentence would appear. And that goes on and on until the Book of Mormon is written according to Mormon history. But folks, whether, whether that is partially credible or all a hoax, I want us to be very clear about something. When it comes to accepting any additional revelation that is additional to the Bible, we're talking about yet another point of departure from historic Christianity. Revelation 22:18 makes it very clear. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Folks, the idea of open canonization is a dangerous idea. Let me finally ask this morning, and this final question really applies. I want it to apply to not only Mormonism, but I want it to apply to people within the Jehovah's Mo Witness movement as well, as we talked last week. How can I reach out to Mormons and Witnesses? We've kind of gotten a snapshot of the way they view Christology, but now let's slow down and ask, how can I reach out to my Mormon friend? Let me give you three quick things. Number one, respect them. Because Mormons are people of faith. We are people of faith. Mormons believe that supernatural events happened in history. We believe that supernatural events occurred in actual history. Let me, let me say it like this. There's something we have in common with Mormons. Both Christianity and Mormonism are what we would call revealed religions, meaning our life bread and answers to everything came outside of us in. So, for example, if supposedly Joseph Smith had never had God the Father appear to him, and the angel Moroni appear to him, and God the Son appear to him, if that had never happened, there would be no Mormonism. Guess what? If God the Father never appeared to Abraham, we wouldn't have any Christianity. If God the Father never broke through human history and actually revealed himself and given us even this word... We would not have Christianity. We are not like Christian scientists. We are not like Unitarians. We believe that we have a revealed religion, a supernatural religion. 
And the reason I say respect them is because they are people of faith just like we are. Therefore, it's irrational to say, you guys believe what? But what's not irrational is to challenge what they believe with what this book says. That's the point of true, respectful argumentation. And that brings me to the second way that we can reach out to Mormons. Know your Bible. There's no skirting around this one. There's no dancing around the fact that we must know what we believe according to the authority of Scripture. And this is not only for the purpose of gently showing them where they're wrong. It's also the means by which it pleases God to open people's heart unto salvation. This is what God chooses. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This past week I was listening to a testimony of a, a woman who came out of Mormonism and it boiled down to one thing. I just read the New Testament for myself. That was it. So number one, respect them. Number two, know your Bible. Here's the third way we can reach out to Mormons. Love them and serve them. Say, that sounds a lot like number one. Well, maybe so. But Mormons are precious people. And so do not come out with guns blazing, say, you believe Jesus and Lucifer were brothers? Chances are your Mormon friend has never even heard that before. You see, we have the benefit today of hearing of hundreds of people who have come out of Mormonism who have lifted the veil to show what it's really about, that means, did you know it's possible for you to know more about Mormonism than its own members? Because like many sects, like many cults, they are only privy to the next bit of information as they remain faithful to the church. Michael Wilder was a, a high council member in the Church of Mormon and he served in two bishoprics. He was so high up in the church that he was a man who literally would stand behind the curtain in the Mormon temple to do special ceremonies. He would, he would play the role of God when it came to him talking to couples being married. And so he's way up there. In 2006, Michael Wilder became a born-again Christian. And I want you to hear what he said. When you join the Mormon church... You are not taught any of these doctrines, and you only get into this as you progress into the priesthood, as you become an Aaronic priesthood holder, then you receive the Melchizedek priesthood, and once you go to the temple and become endowed, then you are given additional knowledge and understanding. And so I emphasize loving and serving Mormons because so many of them do not even know what they've gotten themselves into. And, and right now, I feel a little bit like the Apostle Paul, like saying, I'm out of my mind that I'm boasting of this, but I'm going to boast about something for a very specific reason. Folks, I've been a Christian for over 40 years. I've pastored a church for over 20. I've been in ministry for well over 20. I, uh, this part isn't too impressive, but I've, I've read the Bible cover to cover 12 times. This year will be number 13. I've got a degree in theology and an advanced degree. Why do you say that, Greg? Your head is already bigger than it can be. Here's why I say that. I say that for shock value for what I'm about to say next. This past week, when I read through what is on Mormonism's official website, churchofjesuschrist.org, their doctrines on their website sound like normal Christianity to me. And if that's true for me, no wonder people who have little biblical background fall into this as converts. And so, folks, we need to realize that what people experience and hear on Mormonism's front porch is not what they hear going into the back bedrooms. Sandra Tanner who was deep into Mormonism. In fact, she was the great, great, she is, she's still living, the great, great granddaughter of Brigham Young, 
she also became a Christian. And she said this, when a Mormon missionary knocks on your door, they give you the Book of Mormon because it is the closest sounding book to the Bible. They do not give you their own writings because you would find plural gods and different doctrines. Yes, there is such thing. As Paul said 2,000 years ago, as people who preach another Jesus. And that message that Paul gave the church at Corinth and the church of Galatia is just as relevant today. How about you this morning? Have you believed upon another Jesus? Or have you believed upon the Christ? the Son of the living God, as he is described in this word. You know, I apologize, I've gone long. It's, it's hard to succinctly say things these last two Sundays of religions that have so many details of them. But I want to end in a very specific way this morning, just praying about this last night. Our passage of meditation this morning was pray continually. And I want to end today by praying continually, and I want to pray this way. If you know of anyone in your life, family member, friend, who has believed in another Jesus, I want to specifically pray for that person. And and I just want to pray, pray a general prayer over all of you. But in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand if you'd say, yeah, I, I know someone who has come to believe in another Jesus. And that could be another Jesus because of the religion they're into. You might even call it a cult. It could even be that they've come to believe in another Jesus and they're in a Protestant church somewhere. It could be that they've dropped out of church altogether. They're still okay talking about Jesus, but whenever you talk, you realize that's not the Jesus I know about in the Bible. So for just a moment, I'm not going to ask you to say anything out loud, but if you're here this morning... And you say, I have a friend, a family member who believes in another Jesus. I want to invite you to stand and I'm going to pray for that individual. Well, Father, those standing represent people who need to see the truth of Christ from your word. And so I would pray, Father, for all of those represented Some of us may have in mind a dozen people. Some of us may have in mind a relative. But Father, whatever their names are, and I I just encourage you to picture their face, picture their name in your mind, would you bring them to Christ? Would you show them the truth of your word? Would your Holy Spirit tenderize their hearts to see the glory and the majesty of the Christ that is preached from the Bible, Lord? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. And let me...